Okay, let's get back to the problems with, with the flights going from uh, Chicago to, um, to New York. Well, when those freeways get busted up in an earthquake or something like that, I um, don't have top-down control. So I had problems with controlling anger. You know how I got rid of it? I switched to crying. It's okay for geeks to cry. That's fine. When the space shuttle was shut down, they were crying. <laughs> yeah, you can look it up on 60 Minutes. It's the saddest thing you ever saw. <laughs> but that's why they kept their jobs, and half of them were on the spectrum. <laughs> OK, there's my head. OK, now what you see right now is the connectome. That is all the white matter circuits that connect up to the gray matter, which I hope is in that space in there. I hope that's not full of cerebral spinal fluid. But the gray matter, that's on the outside, and that's where the specialized departments are. All this stuff in the middle is interconnector circuits. Yeah, and you can see it's a big part of the brain is interconnector circuits. And with this new kind of high-definition tensor imaging, you can actually track these circuits. You can actually dissect them out. You can see these little tiny threads down there. Those are single axons all the way across the brain. Let me tell you, when you put a football player in this scanner, it's not pretty. <laughs> and, and this scanner was uh, paid for by our defense department for head injuries. And boy, you don't need a medical degree to use this scanner to look at head injuries. Because you tear these things in half, and they don't grow back very well. OK, there's the connectome without the rest of the head. Now, the thing is, in a head injury, you have rip circuits. In a developmental disorder, they don't grow. Or maybe they grow in an abnormal manner. Now, that circuit right there is a cable bundle dissected out with this scanner. This used to be something you only could do like after I was dead. But now you can do it virtually on the computer. This is a circuit that goes from the visual cortex up to the language area for speak what I see. That's a normal circuit. That's my speak what you see. Now, I ended up with a lot of bushes there. And this may have to do with uh, something to do with why I'm a visual thinker. Because I've got bushes going all over everywhere, connect back to the language part of the brain. Now, the thing is, at what point do you have to have enough bushes to call it an abnormality? Again, it's not black and white. It's not like tuberculosis where I either check the yes box or the no box on a customs form. That's not how neurology works. There's no box there for you sort of have it. <laughs> OK. Now, if you look at the normal one there, there's more fibers, more fibers for speech output. And you see, yeah, I got all those extra bushes, but I got less fibers there for speech output. Well, that would explain why I had such a you know, hard time getting speech out. OK, now these circuits here are speak what you hear. And I've got a real tiny, tiny little shrimp there. <laughs> now, when kids are around third or fourth grade, that's oftentimes when you start to see where they may have an area of strength. And my area of strength was art. That was always encouraged. Build on the area of strength. I cannot emphasize that enough. Because in the work that I've done as a designer, I used my art ability. And what I do in the livestock industry is basically a field called industrial design. Now, if a kid gets hung up and loves airplanes, let's do math with airplanes. Do reading with airplanes. Broaden it out. Because I used to just draw endless horse heads over and over again. Well, let's draw his stable. Let's draw something else. Now, this is a picture a young man sent to me to show how he thinks in movies in his head. That's how I think. And the HBO movie did a fabulous job of showing how I have movies in my head. I hope you can get that movie uh, here. Is it available for downloads here? Good. Glad to hear that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, this shows one of my cattle facilities. Now, you might wonder why make it curved. In fact, the, the biggest plants here have got this. As you come on around the bend, they think they're going back to where they come from. See, cattle have a natural behavior to go back to where they come from. Now, when I draw up these things, 
I can see it in my mind. And I used to think that everybody had visual thinking in their mind. They don't. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why, why a lot of people couldn't figure out a lot of cattle stuff. And what I realized was they weren't seeing it. I've been kind of going on an odyssey of looking at how different people think. And there is my dipping vat facility they recreated for the HBO movie. That was like so super cool. The movie showed my visual thinking correctly, it showed sensory correctly, and it showed all my jobs correctly. Now there are my drawings. Now another thing, and this projector is just sort of all right. This is not the best projector. Um, they, uh, when you're a weird geek, the thing I learned is I had to learn to sell my work. And I sold my work by showing off my portfolio. And when I first started, people didn't want to talk to me. I was too weird. And then I'd whip out my drawings. Well, now today you can put them on your phone. You know, I had to have them in the notebook that I carried around with me. And there's another one of my drawings. The other thing, I started out freelance. One little project at a time. One little article for the farm arrangement. And there's a scene in the movie where I walk up to the editor and I get his card. And people say to me, how'd you get the guts to do that? That gets back to my mother's dinner parties. And this is something I, we need to be doing a lot more teaching on things like shaking hands. I'm seeing kids coming to meetings that don't know how to shake hands. Well, I would have a dinner party. I had to put on my best clothes. The guests had come over. I had to greet them. And it was, good evening, Mr. Wood. Good evening, Mrs. Wood. There was no calling him Holty and VV. Uh-uh, no first names here. And shake hands. You know, and use the right amount of pressure. Take their coat. Serve them snacks. And this taught really important social skills. Now, how do you form concepts when I have all these pictures floating around in my head? The way you form concepts is you sort pictures into categories. And this is a picture a young man sent to me to show how he's putting cats and dogs in different boxes in his brain. See, the thing is, I'm a bottom-up thinker, not top-down. What bottom-up thinking is, you, everything is learned with specific examples. That's the thing. I've got to make you think opposite to how you think. And so how do I learn something like the concept of what rude is? OK, I stuck my tongue out at church. That's rude. I butted in line at the movie theater. That's rude. And when social mistakes were made, they were just corrected out in the community. You know, like let's say I grabbed something off the store. Like I just grabbed something off the shelf in the store. Well, they didn't say, stop it, or no. She just said, put it back. We're not buying candy today. She simply gave the instruction. Now, I realized my thinking was different when I asked people about church steeple. And this is something everybody sees them. Most people don't pay much attention to them. And I was shocked to find out that a lot of people just get this vague, pointy thing, kind of a generalized picture. I don't have that. You know, I see specific ones. OK, I can get ones in Fort Collins where I live. Famous ones, more famous ones. How about chapels? How about cathedrals? I could sort them into different categories. You know, famous cathedrals, chapels. You know, I mean, well, then there's some that look like warehouses. You know, put them in different categories. OK, this is an older type scan that showed that it had a big visual circuit going from my frontal cortex deep into the visual cortex. This is a normal circuit in this case, but it's probably in about the top 20%. OK, this is not so cool. The blue part there is full of cerebral spinal fluid. And I've got a bit of asymmetry that basically trashed out the math department. <laughs> and I have got problems with I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. Let the kid write it down. I'm, I can't multitask very well. Algebra was impossible. And let a kid go right to geometry and trig if they can do it. I'm seeing a lot of kids that are that way. So what do we do about the school requirements? Well, if he gets good enough in math and all the other stuff, the, the colleges won't care. There's ways to get around those things. We've got to start getting into a lot more of the mindset of getting people into jobs. OK, I go back to the cattle industry, and, and I find people where they took a high school welding course. 
the guy who was a really bad student that saved them. Now he's got a really great business building stuff for the cattle industry. See, this is the thing that makes me crazy as I go back and forth in the autism world and the cattle world. Is, I, you know, people that are 40 years up, older and up that made it. And one of the worst things our schools did in the US is taking out the skilled to trade stuff. Absolutely the worst. We got a shortage in the US right now in diesel mechanics and auto mechanics. You know, it's like, um, you know, really good jobs, full benefits. And for some of these kids, it'd be a great job. Not all of them, but maybe about 25% of them. Okay, let's build on the area of strength. Kids with labels have uneven skills. They often have something they're good at, something they're bad at. Too often we pound away on the bad, and we don't do enough on building up the thing that the kid's good at. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. I basically went into like industrial design type of stuff. Another kind of mind is the pattern thinker. This is the mathematical mind. These kids often have trouble with reading. And in my new book, The Autistic Brain, I actually reviewed scientific studies that show that the, that the photorealistic visual mind, like me, and the more visual, spatial, mathematical mind actually exist as two different brain systems. You want evidence-based? It's in the autistic brain book. Now, in these little math kids, you're going to find some of these kids where you need to move them ahead. Then move them ahead. Don't hold them back doing baby math. They'll turn into behavior problems. Then you got the kid that's into all the verbal facts, loves history, all about verbal facts. And uh, the other thing about people on the spectrum is they're really good with detail stuff. There's a lot of stuff they're really good at doing. Now, I'll just show you there's two ways to do the math the language-based way and the more visual-spatial. Now, I want to give you a glimpse into a mind that's not my mind. This praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. No cutting, no taping. What you see in the background, that's the folding pattern. I go, wow, that's not my mind. And here are some great little origami stars that some kids gave to me at, at, a, at a meeting. This is the stuff that saved me when I was a teenager, when I was getting bullied and teased. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was the specialized activities, which was horseback riding, model rocket club, and electronics. Those were refuges away from teasing. We got to get these kids into these specialized things. You know, it's also where they can learn social. Well, how do I think about something abstract? I had to learn the Lord's Prayer, but I didn't have any idea what it meant. But this is my picture for the power and the glory. We got in a rainbow right here with an electrical tower at the base of it. And that picture's real, it's not photoshopped. All right, here is a super important slide. All my thinking uses specific examples to read concepts. I'm going to read this slide, it's so important. It's bottom up thinking, not top down. Everything is learned with specific examples. See, the normal mind tends to overgeneralize. I have people come to me and they say, well, tell me the most important thing for autism. Well, if a kid is two, it's early intervention. But once they get past that, and they just say, well, my kid has behavior problems in the classroom, I can't answer that. I don't know what he did. I don't know how old he is. I don't know anything about him. That's overgeneralizing. I got to have more detail. Play games with categories. This will help teach flexibility of thinking. You know, an object can both be red and it could be rectangular. Maybe some objects only go in one category. The autistic brain gets into details, picks out the little letters quicker than picking out the great big letters. Now, some people will think that these kids just memorize in script. In the beginning, that's what happens. And when I was in high school and I was teased, the thing that the other kids used to call me was tape recorder. And I couldn't figure out why they were calling me tape recorder. Well, I guess now it's just electronic recording device. You know, so they'd go, tape recorder? I guess it's now, you know, electronic recording device now. And the reason why they were calling me that is I always use the same phrases. But as we get these kids out doing more stuff, then 
you have more things for them to Google. They got a really good search engine in their mind, but you got to get them out. Fill their mind up full of stuff. A lot of these kids are way too sheltered, way too coddled. Yeah, you got to stretch them just a little bit beyond their comfort zone.